Okay. Um, just to give a little background, well, my name is Tom. You know, my son works here at Hana uh, Hanama Bay. Um, I used to work for the Division of Aquatic Resources for state with the state for over 36 years and was involved with aquaculture development as well as um, uh, commercial fisheries, recreational fisheries development, uh, where we basically primarily were specializing in food production as well as in terms of uh, recreational sport fishing development, uh, in which the Moi is part of that, yeah? Well, uh, actually, the Moi is part of both food production as well as uh, recreational sport fishing. Uh, my talk will involve marine fishery stock enhancement and fisheries management areas, FMA, MLCD, ELMA, uh, and I'll get to that, what, what those are. Okay, a lot of people don't realize uh, or are not familiar with what the purpose or mission statement for Division of Aquatic Resources is. And this is basically the mission to manage, conserve, and restore the state's unique aquatic resources and ecosystems for present and future generations. So how does aquatic resources attempt to accomplish their mission? So besides you have existing laws, administrative rules, and regulations, a major tool used in the creation, a major tool used is the creation of marine protected areas, otherwise known as MPAs, where certain activities are either permitted and or prohibited. And this is where you have different types of MPAs, FMAs or fishery management areas, marine life conservation districts such as Hanama Bay, uh, or otherwise referred to as the MLCD. And a uh, unique type of uh, MPAs that, uh, that not many people are familiar, the Eva Limu Management Area, called the ELMA. So these are, uh, again, the different examples of uh, FMA, uh, Waik Waikiki Diamond Head Shoreline Area, um, <clears throat> the MLCD, uh, as I mentioned, Hanama Bay, the Waikiki, MLCD off the Waikiki Aquarium, Pupukea MLCD, uh, ELMA, the Eva Limu, Limu Management Area. Okay, <clears throat> what is the Waikiki Diamond Head um, Shoreline Fisheries Management Area? Okay, it, uh, what I'll do is I'm, I'm going over this particular SF, um, SFMA the FMA MLCD, uh, primarily because this is where off of Waikiki we conducted a lot of our MOI stock enhancement work. Um, the location, if you're familiar of the shoreline, is the Eva Wall of the Waikiki War Memorial to the Diamond Head Lighthouse. The fishing period is open, even number of years from January 1st to the 31st. So this year, it open to the public. On odd years, it's closed, January 1st to the 31st. So what is permitted? You can fish, take, possess during the open season. You can fish, hook and line, throw net, spear, hand net, and uh, to land fish, okay? What is prohibited? Basically, during the um, odd years, no fishing, taking, injuring any marine life, including eggs during the closed period, no night fishing, six to six, or have or possess in the water any trap during the open to fishing period, except throw net or hand net used to land a hook fish. So you first have to memorize this, right? Okay. So during the closed season, people just say, or fishermen, fishers say, it's closed, then you go someplace else. Okay. Now what is the Waikiki Marine Life Conservation District? Again, this is an area right off the Waikiki uh, Aquarium, from the Kapuhulu Groin to the Eva Wall of the Road Wall One Memorial Navitorium. Distance offshore is up the high water mark to at least 500 yards offshore, or to the seared edge of the fringing reef if one occurs beyond 500 yards. Okay. Again, permitted, any activity must have a permit issued by God. What is prohibited? You can't take anything. Basically, okay. year round, odd, even years, it doesn't matter. It's closed to any kind of take. That's an MLCD, similar to uh, an anomaly. 
Now, what is a ELMA? Uh, this is a special ever limo management area, which was uh, brought about because of the community concerns of um, they felt the commercial limo taking was destroying their uh, their grounds. So they petitioned to the state to close off areas, uh, waters off Ever Beach, um, from as far as the location to the shoreline, 150 feet seaward. So there's only certain time periods when we can allow to harvest. And uh, if they haven't changed it, it's usually twice a year. Okay. Now, these are some of the programs or projects. Uh, nowadays, it's hard to tell because the state constantly or the divisions because of the attrition, because of retirement, because of lack of funds like that. Uh, there's a number of different changes organization of changes so these basically program the projects recreational sport fishing an example is the dark fish tagging project uh, such as the moi um, goldfish you have the koke in Kauai trout sport fishing wahiwa at lake wilson large mark bass then you have the environmental uh, protection with various species uh, projects or program in which they're raising sea urchin production at Anuinui Fisheries, also the coral reef restoration. There was an article in the paper yes, yesterday, I believe. Um, basically, growing coral to to replant um, in case of catastrophic events such as beach grounding, uh, ship groundings, or hurricanes that, that destroys a reef. Um, you also have Opai Ula and Kelin Pool Protection Habitat Restoration. Um, studies that is going on and then you also have the commercial dealer licensing data collection commercial catch reports commercial dealer vendor licensing and all the interesting kind of stuff yeah <laughs> uh, this is to give you an idea of what uh, the fishery station from the air looks like this is the division of aquatic resources uh, Anuinui fisheries research center this is basically the hatchery there's more tanks on the outside and uh, this is the uh, warehouse area where, and you have the vehicles parked here in the office space there. But this is looking toward uh, the ocean from Aloha Tower. This is to give you an idea what the hatchery looks like. You have the greenhouse type of structure. Inside we have these uh, barbary tanks that were originally designed and used to raise fresh water prawns to recuperate the rosin um, We have, uh, during the process, we have hatch brine shrimp, we have an uh, algae room, and we have large 5,000 uh, gallon tanks in which we raise what we call green water, the fire plankton, to feed the animals. Uh, this is just to give an example of what we were working on in freshwater prawns. This is a rabbit female in eggs, new hatch larvae, this is a post larvae that we have raised after about 21 to 40 days. Harvest them. And this is a layout of the process. Okay, a lot of people may not understand what we what do we mean by stock enhancement. Okay. Uh, and everybody has their own, I guess, definition. This is the definition I came up with, okay, which may not be. Uh, kosher to everybody, but so it is <laughs> what I put together. To enhance existing populations of a targeted species to a sustainable level where the resource is restored to pre-existing or improved levels for future generations. This is the qualifier I like to put in, ultimately to a point where restocking of the targeted species is not necessary. So in other words, it's not a program designed to perpetuate and go on forever and ever. There's a start date, a middle development, and there's an end date, okay? So that it doesn't, you, you basically can work and develop other species instead of just only one particular species. That's how the program uh, uh, that I was involved with, yeah. So, where I'm going now. Okay. What are some of the benefits of stock enhancement. Well, you can enhance the targeted populations 
can maintain existing populations, you can improve recreational, recreational sport fishing, restock um, areas that have been un undergone habitat degradation, you can increase the number of spawning uh, individuals or increase the reproductive potential. Uh, it can also be used as a scientific tool to gain, get a better understanding, movement, behavior, growth rate, uh, basically the reproductive biology of that targeted species. It, it often can complement other fishery management tools with that, so you can come up with reasonable fishing regulations or reasonable habitat restoration in certain areas. These are some of the primary uh, fin fish species that we worked with, I worked with before I left the state, before I left the state. Boy, uh, striped gray mullet, kumu, and uh, various species of ulua, or the jacks. We have the striped gray mullet, we raise the broodstock, catch them out, and pretty successful in terms of raising the pua, or the young ones. And they release it into uh, uh, on a big island in Wakaloa uh, for the recreational sport fishing. This is one species uh, that I was working with, the kumu, white saddle goldfish. Uh, we were the first to spawn them, number one, and to spawn them in captivity in tanks. So this is something I'm really proud of. Unfortunately, in, in Studying this particular species, I found that for aquaculture development, uh, it's very they're very sociable animals, and, and what would happen is that you have a hierarchy in captivity where the animals will kill each other off. So there's a lot of work that needed to be done, but still yet we were able to spawn the captivity and um, work with the larvae to take it to the next level. This is uh, white ulua, the very, one of the species that we working with. Uh, Dr. Lei Yamasaki here, she's with the Department of Ag. Uh, right, she was a volunteer student at the time. Now she's uh, with the Department of Agriculture as a veterinarian. Um, we would basically, once a month like that, uh, we would measure the fish, and then we'd do a biopsy sample. We look at the development of eggs uh, or determine the sex, whether it's a male or female. One very interesting thing, what we found out that uh, a lot of people aren't aware of. They may know that moi are what we call pretender hermaphrodites. That is, they change, they start off as a male, but they reverse to a, change to a female as they get older. What we found with the uh, ulua, with the uh, white ulua, um, was that it also is a potential hermaphrodite. What we further realize that is not reported is that it also reverses back. It can reverse back from a female to a male or hold be a hermaphrodite. And this is what we also observe, for example, with uh, Mahi Mahi. So, to me as a biologist, it was very interesting working with all these different species. Like that. And you never know what what, what are you going to find out? <laughs> okay, so this is uh, uh, in the tank shot of the moi uh, good stock. Normally they are two to three years of age, which is about 1.53 kilograms, so about six pounds, let's say. And uh, what I wanted to show here was we have what we call over testes. Eggs, but the white bordering that you see here is testes. And when we take, when I take a biopsy of that, look at it under the microscope, find out that the sperm is active, alive. The ova, depending on the age of the female, is viable. So it raises a lot of questions uh, in terms of, well, can they self fertilize their own eggs? We didn't see it there. We didn't see it there. Um, we also have the Moi Lee, that this is a young juveniles of Moi. Um, what we will do is we will, I don't think I have a slide uh, here. But we would put in for our stock enhancement work, we would basically uh, 
tag our animals um, with a, what we call a coded wire tag. A coded wire tag is basically a stainless steel microscopic tag that we would inject into the soft tissue of the nose of the boy. So basically, uh, we'll do x-ray and like that, we could direct the, the needle to deposit this microscopic tag in the soft tissue. Why is this important? Because we find out, found out that this particular tag is the most durable once we release it to the wild, where X number of years from now, somebody catches a fish, if you can use what we call magic wand, pass it over the snout of the fish, it will beep, give us, give us a signal, then we could get that information, biological information, come back into our database, trace back the root, roots of that particular fish. Now the VI tag, visible implant tag, there's different types. One is like a silicon, uh, elastomer color tag, either pink, red, purple, green, all different colors that you inject into the clear tissue of the fish. That, was, that wasn't very good for boy, but we experimented with that. The other one is the Floyd tag, or what we call a visible external tag. And this tag basically is what we call like a spaghetti tag, where we would inject it into the dorsal fin, for example. And if you look on this, I forgot to bring the tag to get an idea, but there's a, says, for example, DAR with a number on the tag and a number to call. So a fisherman retrieves this fish, catches the fish, uh, you see, you see this tag and say, ah, it's a, it's a coated wire, uh, or it's a release fish, cultured fish. So when you call in um, the tag uh, number and send in the tag, and you can get vital information when they call it, what time they call it, what kind of gear they use, uh, the general location of where they call it, uh, how big the fish was, at the time it was captured. And this is going to be very important as I go through the talk. Okay. However, there's a problem with this. Okay. What is the problem? Well, we can't hold the fish forever. We don't want to hold the fish at the hatchery until it's so big because it costs money. Time is money. So what we want to do is release them as soon as we can. But when we release them, even at this size, with the external tag, limu, the algae is growing on the exterior portion of the tag. Why? Because at this stage, a lot of the moi will still stay in the shallow areas. So what will happen was limu will grow on the tags, and at the entry point, we will find uh, what, what I call ulceration, a site they wouldn't be proper healing. So it didn't make the fish look pretty good if somebody caught it and said, oh, what are you doing to this fish, poor fish? Okay, so we had to come up with a different uh, idea and what I came up with was placing it, finding a place, or oh, believe me, I tried different places, but one of the places was the anal fin. The reason for this is because when we release it, they're in the shallow water. When they get older, they move out to deeper water. We know that based on our studies. So there's less limo growing on the tag when we put it in the anal fin location. So this worked out uh, pretty good. Yeah. Occasionally, we may find a retriever fish with some growth, but not like when it's on the torso. Uh, again, we also use the spaghetti tags for the uh, papillo like that. It works okay with the papillo because they, they come in and out. They don't necessarily stay in shallow water. So that's no problem with the limo growing on the tail. So different species respond differently. Uh, we would get these fish, we would tag them. Part of it was to educate the public. So we would have a normal uh, release. Volunteers releasing when the Girl Scouts come out, the Browns come out, or um, Boy Scouts, whatever, they will help um, releasing the more. Why is this important? Because I felt it's very important to have the younger generation buy into this idea. Uh, and it really worked when we had a poacher after we released it. That afternoon, uh, Waikiki staff noticed somebody throwing that on some of the fish. 
But what happened was they called the door care officers and then they called me up and they said, uh, can, can I speak in front of, you know, for the press release and all this stuff? So I said, you know what? Get a hold of the Girl Scout, the, the person I was in contact with. So what they did was they had one of the girls interview in the news. And when they showed it on the interview or watching TV, and, and when they were interviewing the girl, now that's, that person that helped in the release did not roll the fish, did not feed the fish. All she did, all she did sort of, was release the fish. But there was ownership. You know? And that ownership basically was worth a million bucks. When you saw a tear come down her cheek. And she was being interviewed. The so cameraman pan, and she said, "I don't know why you know, these bad people would do this kind of thing to our, to, you know, to, the, to our fish." You know, she had ownership. And that was very important. So I was there cheering on. That, yes, that's what we want. That's what we want. Okay. So just to give you an idea, on Earth Day we would have our annual release like that. And this is the fish after they release. You notice they're in shallow water, so I can take a picture. Now this is the area, Waikiki Diamond Head study area. Very important because on one side, this is uh, 13 locations, fixed, fixed spots. And we'll send out a crew, uh, staff from Aquatic Resources, Tronet, basically to do a sample along the shoreline once a month. Cast net, monthly cast net sampling. Okay. What do we find? Well, the initial study basically found that through all 13 stations, we had a good mixture of wild and cultured moi, okay. uh, as evidenced by the different color colors, the bar colors. Furthermore, over time, uh, I don't have the present data, but this is when I was uh, doing uh, working on this project. That's why um, this is some old data, but it basically shows 1999, 2004 percentage of wild percentage of culture that we were picking up started decreasing. Why? It's good, okay? Because the assumption you could make was. Maybe they're mating with the wild population and producing offspring. So what we're finding is that we're finding less of the culture uh, when we initially we did in 1999. Then in 2004, now we're finding more wild. So in summary, this is the total number of culture tag more that we released. 1999 to 2009, 64,518. Uh, total number of captured as of February 2009 was 213, of which 28% were wild, 72% culture. This is very, very exciting. Our most recent recapture, um, although I'm retired uh, from the state, I still volunteered on the fishery station because I, I, I believe in what we're, the project that we we're doing and I'm trying to follow as best as I can and help as much as I can um, on this project. The most re recent recapture was uh, released in Honolulu Harbor off our facility in 12 December 04, uh, 04 in a forklift of 6.1 inch. It was a capture 10 years and two months later. 10 years two months later off Kauai and it had a fork length size of 11.5 it's measured by the fish okay. what does this tell us it tells us the more capable of traveling long distances and into deep waters and can cross deep channels which improve the recruitment potential okay in other words not only more, we've seen this occur in terms of crossing the channels. We've seen it with um, Papio, uh, and we've seen it with Mahi Mahi. Okay. 
Oh, you might I could expect, yeah, it's a Atlantic Ocean fish. But this totally shocked us when we saw that. I mean, we hoped for the best. But when we got it, oh, fantastic. Okay. <laughs> the previously uh, estimated boy lifespan was eight years. And what we now learn, we have positive proof that the boy can live over 10 years in two months. Okay. The fisherman ate it. I think he ate it. He ate the fish. <laughs> Okay. The other thing is that stock enhancement efforts can successfully contribute to more fishery stocks. Okay. So, even if, um, as I mentioned about the moi stock enhancement with the, um, the cultured fish, the percentage of cultured fish, uh, and the number of percentage of wild fish being caught over the years, okay. Before we left, we instituted a, a DNA component or, or tracking component in which we were, we know that from the offspring that we released, we did DNA testing on the broodstock. Um, and the broodstock are basically uh, an aggregate of one to one ratio of male to females of adult fish that are reproductively active or, or potentially active and viable so we would have maybe about 12 fish in one of those 5,000 gallon tanks the problem is we don't know what the genetic material is coming from so what we did was we did dna testing of all the big stock both males and females and of the of the eggs of off and the offspring of what we used to release Thereby, we have a DNA bank, data bank, so that currently, when the staff goes out and catch moi or the moi fin flips are turned in by fishers like that, we can have the DNA process of the fin flips look into our database, backtrack to see if it came from our stock enhancement good stock effort. That that is when I will retire after that. But that is what we're after. We're very close to getting the results, whichever way it comes out. Okay. But um, I think if we have the DNA confirmation that the offspring has made it with the wild stock and we have evidence, DNA evidence of it, then I'll be a happy camper with that, that you know, our project will. If you have any questions like that, uh, this is the station uh, number, as well as there is a Moy hotline, also a tagging project hotline. If you catch any uh, fish like that, we will report you. Okay, and uh, that's it. Thank you. Uh, any questions? Current state is basically no. They ha, there is no releases of cultured fish. Um, after I left, um, um, basically the program uh, was shut down for saving of monies. Uh, although I disagree, it was I, I felt it was a terrible decision made by the Lingo administration. Um, it basically was to save money. However, the administration did not realize that we were the funding of our project was through Dingo Johnson, which is a three to one federal matching to each uh, U, uh, each state dollar that was put into the pot. So by cutting our program, she basically saved the dollar but lost three dollars. Okay, with the idea, I'm sure that after the shutdown, not only my project, some other projects that they will go back to the program and try to grab those funds which they couldn't so it was the public that suffered and, and that was one of the reasons why i retired <laughs> yeah, but what about the history itself i mean is it i'm not familiar with the wine history uh, is this the now yes you can okay in your opinion, is it a sustainable population now, or is it? I, I, it from what um, I see, it, it's a 
sustainable it's a sustainable fisheries now what boy fishing fishing is basically quite unique um where boy fishermen sort of are very protective uh, of their location um so they won't disclose you know where they're fishing and we don't expect them to disclose just give us a general location okay so it is a, a unique type of fishery okay recreational fishery uh, overall, from what we see, and what we see in the monthly samplings like that, it's pretty healthy. And it's amazing, because one of the other things that what we've uh, identified is the busiest stretch of Shoreline Beach, which is our study area along the FMA, Waikiki, Aquarium, all the way to the Diamond Head Lighthouse. So Ilika Hotel, all the way to the Diamond Head Lighthouse. The busiest section, tourism, swimmers, surfers, divers, we identified two nursery moili sites in that area based on our sampling. Why is that important? Because it's a recruitment. Every year we see uh, the moili coming back. And that's very important. To, if we don't see it, then I'd be worried but we we'll continue to see it. So why do you yeah. think that area is such a important nursery area in particular location? Yeah, uh, um, what I'm hoping, uh, and we don't know for sure, okay, uh, that, uh, for example, salmon. Salmon, you know, come home to the stream in which, uh, you know, they breed or whatever, okay. We see some indication that this may be occurring with moi, okay, and I'm hoping there is so that the offspring, future offsprings will come back into the Waikiki area. Um, we also see uh, that area is good because um, the adults are usually in rough water, okay? Um, so you have to be a very good fisherman, seasoned fisherman, uh, to stay safe and yet catch this highly prized fish. Okay? Your commercial fishermen normally do not sell their moi catch. Why? Because they take it home to their families. It's that, such a good eating fish, okay? Um, so the boy younger ones, the juveniles, tend to like more sandy areas, okay? And surprisingly, in our research, we found out that, hey, they like calm areas too, like off Waikiki. When we started, we didn't know what to expect. We didn't know what to expect, but nothing was done. But I thought, yeah, you have an open fishing area year-round from Ilikai, to the Kapahulu going. The fishermen can go there, they can fish there year round. And then you have the totally closed area okay, with no tape. And then you have off open and closed area. Okay, so that make an ideal site to do us releases of our moi. So we did a release basically uh, from Sand Island. We didn't tell the fishermen where we release. We know, you know why, okay? Uh, so I always tell them there's three release sites, okay? Um, Sand Island, um, off Waikiki, like at the, within the MLCD, okay, and off Diamond Head. Okay. I wouldn't tell them when, okay, just that those are the three release sites. Okay. Um, and some of the more they release, like the Earth Day, for example, we found some that retrieved, fishermen retrieved it, Eva Beach, all the way to Port Lock. Okay, so really and that that is what we wanted okay so uh, i'm really encouraged i i just wish that you know we could have continued doing what we were doing but i think the dna analysis that we're trying to find will really help to answer some of the questions of the of the next step or the next generation the eager beavers that come on board and say hey we want to do more stock enhancement well you don't have to reinvent the wheel if you do it this way, you have the best likelihood of success. So I guess, could you test your hypothesis of the salmon migration if you took some fingerlings that were really small tank and, and released them in a couple of specific areas and then look maybe seven, eight years later or whatever the section do? That's what you're trying to do. Yeah. yeah. But based on catch, the catch data, either from the cast net monthly sampling 
which would really tell us whether there is some kind of homing. Now, the recreational fishermen, the uh, uh, boy fishermen, tell us, okay, the, basically, uh, this is in the Kahuku area, for example, um, where they have certain areas which they call the ice box. Why they call it the ice box is that they never take everything. If they throw a net or cast or, or pull a line, they never remove every boy that in their hole or where they fish. They always take only what they need. Leave the rest. X, X number of months later, oh, we're going to have a party. Okay, we'll need some boy. They go back to the refrigerator. Same area. But they never catch, catch it all. So that tells me the boy, at least the bigger ones, like that, tend to recruit their own calls, basically, to that area. Uh, why fish come to an area? Primarily, they come for feeding, okay, or sex, okay? So, but why the same area? That's another question, see? So, see, yeah, there's a lot of data we don't know, a lot of information we don't know, but, uh, from what we saw, you know, it's really encouraging, I felt. Could we go back retrospectively and look at, and show the one slide where you had the increasing uh, percentage of wild fish being caught versus their release? Sure. That, was that a compilation of all your site data? In other words, could you go back to your three different sites and look at the ratios of wild to the culture? I would expect that the open season you should see a um, bigger drop in their culture percentage in a while. Maybe, um, maybe not, but just see if there was a difference. Yes. Um, our, our data, this, the data that we collected here is based on monthly cast net samples, what we call blind casts. Okay, uh, certain six foot diameter spread uh, net. Uh, small, right. So, so, you don't so, have data from the, uh, no, it did cover. Um, or is that cover? yeah, yeah, like, uh, yeah, like, like we have 13, we have 13 okay. stations, but we have within the each station, there's so many sites, okay. okay. The, so many, uh, like 100 meters stop, blind throw. Okay. 100 meters blind throw, so, but there's, there's certain, uh, you know, with GPS, like that, coordinates like that, uh, they can backtrack to the same area. So uh, when I look at the data, or look at the data um, you know, based on site, and there are certain sites along the Waikiki shoreline, where we always see certain size waiting on the juveniles. Like More so around here, let's say, than around here. And that, that was fascinating. And now, not only at one site, we would find like two sites within a particular station. I mean, I, that was This this is okay. Um, the open close season, um, which is from this area of the natatorium to the Daniel Hill Lighthouse. So uh, it it was a decision that was made. A lot of these decisions are normally made because of public 
requests, competition, stakeholders. Okay. Did, yeah. Now, from a management standpoint, did it make sense? No. Uh, I feel it did not. So, to prove that case, what we did was we studied also the open close season. How long, once it opened, we would go down and we would survey. I'll have my guys go out, walk the beach, survey all the fishes, whether they're pulling line, whether they're throwing it, whether they're skin diving. And basically, what we found, it didn't take six weeks. It, it took about a, a week, a week and a half before everything or the previous census that we, we made, all of a sudden, there wasn't any fish. So that's why the divers don't come around anymore. So. How many times do you wait for the period? About three. What time is it now? You try. You try. Do we have a second? No. No. Okay. Well, we can, you can show me later, though. I can show you. Yeah, we just. Yes. I didn't hear what you meant by recruitment. Recruitment? It's a good area for recruiting. Um, recruitment basically is if you have fish in one area, okay, remove all the fish, okay, then you may or may not have more of that same species in that area. But if you leave some back, okay, it's like, uh, hey, this is a good surfing area. So if you see somebody surfing over there, the neighbor comes, more people come or recruit into that area. Okay, so in fishing, it's always wise not to take out everything. Okay. Uh, a classic or a sort of related uh, answer to that question. Uh, I was asked to go down to Tahiti, okay, because they were, they were, they were interested in the Moi tagging project that we were doing. So they wanted to do some something familiar, but they were having problems with their uh, raising the Moi. So they asked me to come down there to consult what, what was the problem. I had gone down there and, and explained to them and, and gave a similar presentation like this, okay, a little bit more in depth. Then the question was raised, oh, we, we want to do what you guys are doing, stock enhancement. Okay. But the question I raised to them was, why? Okay. They, oh, because it's good for the fisheries. However, in French Polynesia, in Tahiti, they don't have like a fishing game. They don't have rules on the management of your fisheries. Okay. In other words, I told them, why are you raising fish to enhance the, the take because they're just going to harvest, the, the community is going to harvest. So why don't you just give it to them then? Okay, uh, developing an aquaculture program makes more sense okay, to help you develop your economy than trying to do what we were doing in Hawaii to stock enhance. At least we have some management rules on take, size, season, those kind of stuff. But there it was, you know, oh, the, the people have to eat, so uh, there's no rules. So in that sense, uh, I highly recommend it. You know, until you get rules that you're going to not only make but enforce, it does not make any sense to do any kind of stock enhancement. Uh, if you release it into a site where there's moi, there's a good chance that you attract more moi what we don't know, as I mentioned, is whether there's some kind of homing behavior. Okay. I'm hoping because when we took samples from our, our monitoring sites uh, in, in the monthly sampling, okay, we could check those fin flips and look backtrack into a database whether the offspring came from the broodstock that we released. See, what's very complicated is you have the male genes, you have the female genes. Cross, you have a combination of both genetic material 
supplied by both the male and female. Okay. What we're after is that this particular offspring mates with either a wild moi or even a cultured moi. And we're looking at the next generation or seeking the next generation fin clips and then comparing it and backtracking to see whether they came from the parents. That's, a, that's the evidence I'm, I'm looking for. Okay, so it, it's, it, it's a good a master's or a PhD study, okay, that would, would really shine some light on it. But we're working on the preliminary data right now to verify whether this would be genetic DNA proof that what we did work in stock enhancement. Now, unlike salmon, which the fish come back to the area, they have a continental shelf. We have the island, <laughs> the island, yeah, goes into the deep. Uh, not many people are doing this kind of research, except we were doing it. Okay. Yes, Tom. I, I just have a history, but uh, they're traveling in the Yeah, you're flying fish from your Uh, the one, just, that one. just that one, that one fish. So hopefully in the future we have more. But we did on um, Kauai and Maui, but the fish that were tagged was came from Honolulu. That's why we knew that it was a Honolulu fish, cross channel fish, we, we, which to us was wow. Amazing. Yes. This is a tag moi that uh, we had to change the position of location of the, the tag um, because when we put it on the dorsal, we would have uh, algae growth, which basically didn't look good because of the movement it will cause cause ulceration and the tissue wouldn't heal so it didn't look good if you caught the fish and said Ew. okay <laughs> maybe edible the whole fish may be edible but it wouldn't look nice okay or we may have complaints from the fishermen they say what are you guys doing so what we did was experiment in a different location we found out by placing it in the anal fin portion doesn't hurt the fish but because the fish spend some time when upon release in the shallow water, this would cause the algae to grow. But the body itself would cover the sunlight. So the tag wouldn't be exposed to sunlight. So we get less limo growing on the tag. So and until they got to a point where they were big and they move offshore. So when you look at the uh, again, uh, we have regulation, fish regulations, a, a recent newsletter, more newsletter, uh, and then uh, the tight calendar, pocket tight calendar. Um, but, you know, basically it, it, it provides you with the latest information on the moi uh, we captured, that, that across channel moi. Yeah, so. <coughs> Some of the behaviors that will come back, like give an example of one of those behaviors. Behavior. Uh, we, we had just mentioned. Uh, hold that, what, what do you mean hold them back? I mean, maybe not hold them back, but the behaviors of. The boy? Yeah. Uh, yeah, more, more uh, I would consider them of bright fish or smart fish. Moi is like one, one of those not too smart. Okay, uh, let, let me put it that way. And I say that because they can be easily caught. Okay, these are as juveniles, moily size. Uh, when they're older, then they're smarter. Okay, you go into rough water where not really accessible except by the diehards. Okay, but when they're young, they're very susceptible. Okay, um, they come in with, for example, wama schools when you see Oama schools like that, a lot of times they swim with them. But if you're an Oama fisherman, a lot of times you catch, have a tendency of hooking more and more lee than Oama. Okay. Uh, okay. So uh, that tells me, hey, you guys are not too bright. 
Now, as far as when they're younger, they stay in shallower, shallower water where you're exposed to sunlight. And for tagging purposes, that's not ideal. So uh, this is why we had to change the location on a, put them on the bottom, and that led to better retention. Unfortunately, there is a limitation to these spaghetti tags, okay? Uh, maybe five years. So when we had the cross-channel 10-year-old moi, it still had the tag. So I said, yes, okay? <laughs> this location works, okay? Uh, secondly, in five years, it, it, you know, to stay on 10 years that long, it's great. Now, we always can confirm by looking at the coded wire tag, the microscopic tag that I mentioned here, okay, in the snout. But with the visible tag like that, you know, we didn't have to do <coughs> dissect out, excuse me, in a coded wire tag to confirm, okay. We knew it was a fish that crossed the channel.